Welcome to the 1000 Comics Podcast. It's your host, Matt Heath. Uh, boy, do I got an episode for you guys today. I got Whitney Allen on the on the program today. We'll, we'll get to her in a minute. Um, you know, it's really interesting during my stay here in New York. Um, the other day, I went with uh, my buddy Joe Fox. We went down to uh, the Comedy Cellar and saw Dave Attell headline. And... Um, I, I, I got the chance to meet Dave Attell. I, I was talking to him for a few minutes. I, I asked him if he he would be on the podcast. He uh, politely turned me down. He said, maybe not right now, but maybe in the future. And he said, send me a, a DM on on, um, on Facebook, and I'll, I'll get back to you. Um, uh, you. Just to mention one of his jokes that he did that night, which I thought this was very strange, because I took a picture with him. And... He made a joke that he said he's a, a comedian that's that's um, good looking only in the fog. He's he's only good looking in the fog, um, holding a lantern. And when I looked back at the the picture the next day of uh, me and him, I realized I was wearing a a t shirt of the Led Zeppelin for inside cover with the with the Piper holding. Holding the lantern, um, and I just thought that, like, that could he have been making a joke about my T-shirt? And to go to take this even deeper, um, Dave Attell is the Piper calling you to join him because he plays a recorder at the end of his set it, for for whatever reason. He plays a children's recorder, um, as as a pipe and um. He's he's the piper calling you to join him, and that, so I sent him a message the next morning, and then later that afternoon, he sent me a message back. David Tell sent me a, a message on on Facebook, um, saying once again that that he can't do any podcasts right now, post pandemic and all, um, which is understandable. He wished me luck with uh, all my um, shows that I'm doing here in New York. Uh, t- uh, to me, that's like the mayor of New York comedy, Dave Attell, sent me a DM wishing me luck with my shows while I'm here in, in, in New York. And I couldn't believe it. I thought that was that was awesome. Um, I, I don't think I could feel any more um, validated on, on this trip to New York, getting a message from Attell wishing me luck with my, with my shows here in New York. I, I, it made me feel really good. Um, uh, let's just get a little quick ad read in here. You've probably heard a lot about cannabidol or CBD, but have you heard about the plant science company taking the lead and providing the highest quality CBD nationwide? At your CBD store, Simsbury, you will find a fantastic staff that creates a comfortable environment where you can find uh, and get your questions answered and get the right products and the relief you need. They will be your number one source for providing the education and uh, about products for you and your pet. They offer a full line of edibles, creams, USDA certified oils, and more, all developed under the guidance of their PhD analy- analytical chemist and health leaders across the industry. And to back up their story, they also provide extensive third-party testing to ensure what's listed on the products is actually what's in the products. They're located at 1243 Hot Meadow Street in Simsbury and open seven days a week. Give them a call at 860-217-1433 or visit their website at ycbdsimsbury.com or stop in for free samples and get the highest quality products you can find. Your CBD store, Simsbury, where good health hits home. Um, before we I, we get into this um, interview with Whitney Allen, she's been doing comedy um, a couple months now. Uh, she's been doing improv longer than that. Uh, huge Dungeons and Dragons fan, um, but she um, just just came and visited me for, for for the past couple days here in New York. We've been hitting up open mics together for the past two days straight, just hitting it hard. And um, you know, she's very, um, you know. As unexperienced as she is, as uh, um, so in terms of stage time, I feel like she's very wise. Um, 
the open mic we did today over at Greenwich Village Comedy Club, um, I I was a little um, uh, mean to a couple comics. I I feel like um, in terms of roasting them for, I I heard a couple of stolen jokes today. Um, one was that white people don't use washcloths, which is a Chappelle joke, and I felt the need to call somebody out for that. And another guy uh, said he w- he went on a snipe hunt. Um, he went on a snipe hunt. Some guys at a bar tricked him into going on a snipe hunt, which is something that happened to Frazier in an episode of Cheers. Um, you know, and I felt the need to call these guys out on this... Um, Plagiarism. Um, uh, Whit- Whitney um, felt differently. She felt like um, that that um, I, I it was not my place, and I and we 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 disagreed. But you know, she she's definitely right about one thing: um, being nice to people will get you way further in this business than than. Uh, than being mean, um, and that's something that 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 um, I remember Conan O'Brien said in his last episode of of doing the, the 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 Tonight Show was that just being nice to to everyone um, will get you really far in this business, and you know, um, you know, I it's tough because I. I do feel like people need to be called out on on their shit when um when they um if 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 something if a joke has has already been said by another comedian I feel like people need to be called on it but maybe I should have said that to them off stage I I didn't need to say it on stage um cuz cuz what I did was I intentionally tanked a set and then I don't know. I, I was also supposed to hang out with my cousin Lauren today, and um, you know I ended up not seeing her. And you know, one, part of this trip to New York is like I really wanted to spend some time with my family. I haven't seen seen them, you know, at all yet. And um, I just feel like the negative vibes I put out today immediately came back to. To you know, it, I felt like I was putting out negative energy and received negative energy today, and I should just keep putting out positive energy. Positive energy is so important. You know, I feel like literally anyone in the world could make it in comedy. Um, so why not just always be positive and do good things and do good things for people and say. And be nice to people, because how? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm. We're all, at the same time. We're all only human. We are only human. Um. I. I. The other day, I was also questioning why. Why am I here? Why did I even take this trip? Um, I was watch, walking by Cat's Deli the other day, and it said it opened in 1888, and I, I thought, you know, wow, you know, my family started their lives in this country right here on the Lower East Side, and, you know, it's, it's odd that it feels like home to me here, even though I've never really lived here. But it does feel like home in a way. It's, it feels like the roots the roots are just so so deep here. And I I wanna I just wanna make you know I wanna make my friends proud, I wanna make my family proud. Um you know Well that's enough from me. Why don't you enjoy this interview I did with um, the very funny, the very smart, the very talented Whitney Allen. All right, well, 
Welcome to the 1000 Comics Podcast. I'm sitting here today with my guest, Whitney Allen. Hi. How you doing? Good. I'm still tired from the stairs. <laughs> it is a long way up. I call it the, the Jacob's Ladder of, of comedy. <laughs> yes. All the comedians have climbed those stairs at least once. Uh, who have been on the show, mm. or at least recording here? Yeah. Think and just think of adding adding four times however many comedians have been on the show, how many flights of stairs? That's a lot of maths for me to process. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I can't do math. That's why I did comedy. It's okay. Never mind. Well, <laughs> it hurts oh, my brain. It was it was a rhetorical question anyway. Oh, phew. <laughs> um. I'll just keep my chaos internal then. Well, I I'm actually a little surprised to see you just because it's like we were planning for tomorrow. Tomorrow wasn't gonna work, and then we were planning next week, and then we were like, "You want to just do it today? Today?" And you're like, "Today's good. Today." And now you're here. So and now I'm here. Yeah. Compulsive decisions. That's that's how I go about life. Really? Yeah, that's kind of how I got into comedy to begin with. Compulsive decision. That, and I was also going through like a weird quarter life crisis too. Like I was wrapping up with a six year relationship. In, impulsive or compulsive? Uh, probably both. I I would say I make a lot of impulse decisions with mm-hmm. with the comedy. I do. Yeah, tell me more. <laughs> well, you know, it's just it's just weird. We we. Ha- and I, I don't typically ask comics to do this show so quickly, but, you know, we just have so much in common. We're both comics from the same town. I know. And, and I, you're the first comic I've uh, ever interviewed that's also from East Line. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't think I've come across anyone else from East Lime who does comedy. Right. Wait, Um, you weren't born in East Lime, were you? I was technically born in Norwich, but, like, we moved to East Lime when I was two. Two. So, So, yeah. So, you were raised, born, like, yeah, raised in East Lime. Oh, yes. Yep. So, and you knew, you told me you knew my brother. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know if he knows me though. What, I don't, what I don't me- know if he remembers well, me. Well, you what memories do you have of my brother Pete? Is, is what <laughs> I I'm remembered wondering. in third grade. He would always talk about The Simpsons. He would. Yes. It's probably because it's all I would talk about. That's probably why. I think I remember he talked a lot about you, a lot about The Simpsons. Um, I just remember he had a bit of a chuckle, um, and then like some of his. I wish I remembered my other classmate uh, classmate's name. Uh, Because he always talks about corn, and I think (laughs) both of them would always laugh at each other in, in like, a good sense, so I remember those memories. Well, there was uh, these kids that would always talk about corn, um, Mike and Shane Davies. Shane Davies, that rings a bell. It's not them, but I remember Shane But Shane, when we were kids, used to go by Popeye. Oh. Yeah. You know what? I remember, I think I remember Shane from fourth grade. He was really good at math. Yeah. And then I think sometime in high school he wound up in like uh, math in the same math class as me. So. And now he's probably doing really well in life, and uh, we and we're comics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, so um, I'm just curious because we're both 29 though. I know. But you are like two years behind me in, in school because you went to you were in class with my brother. Yes. So uh, growing up, I well, if it's not clear already, I have general anxiety, uh, and so and I think that also plays into how I tried to get through school. Uh, I did maybe a week or two in second grade, and then I was pulled back to go back into first grade. Uh, and then for the longest time, I was like, man, I'm in special ed. I'm going to do everything I can to get out. And I finally got out in sixth grade. But uh, let's just say maybe decades go by. I was looking at some of my paperwork to see if I happen to have like other diagnoses like ADHD or OCD and all that stuff. Um, turned out I was never in special ed. Really? I, I had like a speech pathologist who would pull me out once a week to like, 
help me out with my speech, but I was never in special But education. just because it was a teacher that wasn't the main teacher, you just assumed yes. it was special ed. I utilized the bus services, too, and I was like, man. Like, it was so confusing to look over, like, that Wait, you just work. got on the short bus yeah. even though you weren't supposed to get on? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> In all fairness, my brother was also, like, my brother was in special ed, and I think I was there to support him, but... <laughs> oh, okay. All right. But for the longest time, I was like, I was in special ed, and when I saw those paperwork, I was rocked. I was like, okay, well, this is my life now. So, was it like, a, I feel like it was like some kind of, like, memento-type moment where you're like, I haven't been special this whole time? I was never special to begin with <laughs> that's what happened and my mom was so casual about it too she's like yeah you were never in special ed it was just like maybe like a little bit but you were out after kindergarten i'm like you gotta be kidding me well i did you ever watch the show like malcolm in the middle growing up i've seen some episodes i feel like that show kind of like towed the line of like you you were never quite sure if the cl the class that he was put in was it a special ed class or was it a class for like in like intelligent like overly intelligent people? Yeah. And they you you were never it would kind of go back and forth and you were never really sure right. what the deal was with that. Mm -hmm. So so you're you're kind of like Malcolm in the Middle is what I'm trying I to am, say. But you're I'm... like the Frankie Muniz of East Line. Ooh, is that a good <laughs> thing? <laughs> I. So I guess way back, yeah, that's a good thing. What happened to him? Didn't he like get? Out I think of he had like a stroke at like the like our age, like Jeez. age of thirty or something. Yeah. Oh god. He was in a band for a while. Yeah. Me, me and my college roommate saw saw him at the outer space, like oh, shit. over yeah, nice. and uh, he was playing at drums in a band for a while. All right. Yeah. Go Frankie. Yeah. But yeah. So it turns out he wasn't special either. <laughs> We just never got to learn the last name. I was, that's, that's what I asked him when I met him. I was like, so what's your last name on Malcolm in the Middle? <laughs> <laughs> and he never got the last and name. And he never, he didn't, you know, he was like, oh, I was supposedly Wilkerson or something, but like, they never actually say. Ah, uh, so it was never actually official. It was never officially said the last name on that show. Mm, yeah. That is a bummer. So, so when did you start doing comedy? Okay, so when you mean comedy, do you mean stand-up, or do you mean my whole, the whole com comedy world? Well, let's get, I want to hear a whole comedy world type talk. All right, so, um, as I mentioned before, I was wrapping up with a six-year relationship. I make it sound like I was graduating, but no, it just tanked. Anywho, I wound up getting into improv over at CT Comedy Theater, and I'm like, wow, these are things that I should have learned when I was in school. And, like, there's something very therapeutic at the time. Right. Um, and so I kept doing improv, tried to go to as many practices, taking classes. Um, and then, oh, on top of that, too, I was also taking sketch writing class because I had an interest in, like, writing sketches, finding the beats. Now, all that now how, how is the CT improv? Because I... I um, don't know much about it. I haven't I really had anyone on the show really ever sure. talk about it. Yeah, um, I really like it. Um, I think it's probably one of the best that you'll find in the state. Um, right. Especially when as good as Second City. Yeah, because yeah, honestly... We're going to start I'm... recruiting people on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> yes. What do you think? I think there are some people who wound up like going off uh, to do like really big stuff. I think some of the... Mm, I wish I remembered the names, but I know some of them had done some really big things after. If you can't remember it, it doesn't count. I know. <laughs> so the thing is, like, I only did CT for, like, uh, no more than two years, but also with COVID kind of just throwing things into a weird loop, I don't know where my time stamp is. Um, so I'm very new to, like, the comedy world itself. Um, let's see. What else? Oh, and then I did sketch writing. And then COVID happened. And then... Instead of taking a break with improv and all that stuff, I got connected to a group in L.A. Okay. Where they did, uh, they're called the Pack Theater, so they did improv, they did sketch writing. They, I believe they actually had a stand-up class, but I never took the class yet. Um, but with the Pack Theater, I did a lot of sketch writing to like really strengthen that muscle. Right. And then 
one day, <laughs> I feel like I'm jumping all over the place because I'm also going to say, and I got onto TikTok and I was watching some things on TikTok. There was this woman, her name is Laura High. She did a lot of stand up stuff and I saw one of her lives, wound up just messaging her, all that good stuff about comedy. And we do, pe to... do people put their stand up on TikTok? Because I, I I feel like I'm missing the boat on this. Should I be putting stand up videos on tip TikTok? It it doesn't hurt. Um, TikTok's a weird world though. Like I've been a little bit on a month hiatus with TikTok just because the demand of having to consistently put stuff out is a lot. Um, if you already have stuff like, if you already have vid videos, it's just a matter of uploading them. Yeah. But it's a bit of a gamble, too, because not everyone's going to see your posts. It's like, it'll be sent to, like, random people who will probably, like, if you're interested in comedy, you may like this person. And you'll just get, like, the most random people from across the world, essentially. Mm, that might be a good thing, though, being that, like, my YouTube page... You know, you have to know about my YouTube page to go to the YouTube page. And a lot of times with TikTok creators, they'll use TikTok as a platform to bring people to their Instagram or their YouTube and all that stuff. So it has some benefits. The drawback to TikTok is that it's made for, like, uh, what are they called? Influencers. Right. And... It, you know, we're the same age, but I feel like you're like a teenager explaining <laughs> I don't TikTok know. TikTok to me right now. It, you know, <laughs> like, it's... Finally it's, someone with the sensibility to explain TikTok listen, to me. Listen, maybe... You know what? Maybe I am 24. I have no fucking clue. <laughs> Everyone keeps saying, like, I thought you were 24. And the more time that people say that, the more I'm like, you know what? Maybe I am 24. I should just go with that. <laughs> 24. All right. Yeah. I can believe it. Yeah. I'll keep getting carded, but it's all right. Um... <laughs> Actually, at one of the, I, I know we're going off on a tangent, but um, over at Cafe Nine, uh, one of the uh, regular bartenders who I saw multiple times keeps asking for my card. I'm like, oh, right. okay. And then she sees it. She's like, oh, damn, I'm 29. I'm like, I know. <laughs> and, and you do the mic over there. How do you like the mic over there at Cafe I, Nine? I like it. I think it's, it's a good mixture of comedians it's also a good mixture of locals who'll just come in and just enjoy a night yeah um i feel like i get and plenty of hecklers too there are i haven't come across any when i go up i've heard uh mm -hmm. oh there was one a couple weeks ago um did you hear about the nine-year-olds at cafe nine no there's a nine-year-old that went okay. to cafe oh, nine? okay there were a group of nine-year-olds let me be clear so <laughs> uh and this was i believe my first time Going up to Cafe Nine? Wait, I think I heard Dan Calway yes. say something about, like, a bunch of kids came up on bicycles or yes. something. Yes. No, it's them. And then one of them... Okay. Uh, I don't know if you have a sensor warning or anything like that. But one of them came into the entrance, and I guess one of the comedians were talking about active shooters. And, like, this nine-year-old is like, I will be my high school active shooter. And it's like, oh... And then, what? Yeah, it was crazy. And then... The, Talk about influencers, huh? A comedian is talking about school shootings on stage, and a little kid is there to hear it and be like, I'm going to go shoot up a school. <laughs> it, yeah, it was terrible timing. Wow. Terrible timing. Because I think the, the main message of the comedian was something different, and this little kid took it as like this whole different thing. I think he was just looking for a shock factor and just looking for attention. So just the little kids roaming the streets of New Haven, yeah. unattended minors just coming in. Yeah. The world is just havoc at this point. I know. And, uh, and it's funny, too, because by the time I got up, there was like maybe five people who were actually engaged. Everyone else was outside trying to heckle with the nine-year-olds. And I'm like, uh, it was it was a weird night, but it was fun, though. Right. <laughs> Okay, so so rewind for a second yes, because we need a rewind. How how long have you been doing stand up? I stand up say now. about two months. Two okay, so super new. But you have such a such a strong background of comedy now that you feel like um, you could fit right into this world of stand up. Ah, uh, so that actually ties into uh, what I was going to talk about. So Laura High, who uh, is over in New York, <laughs> we're, we're recording. Wait, there's someone so, behind yeah, me. It was, a, it was, a, it was <laughs> just my neighbor. Sorry, I thought you were miming something. I'm like, wait, my improv impulse is like, yes, and. 
Now I gotta put a big red light out on the deck so my neighbor, when he wants to come over for a cup of sugar or whatever, you know, whatever the hell he wants. <laughs> <laughs> How adorable. Uh, Laura Hi, who's in New York City. Uh, so we wound up connecting on TikTok. Right. And I sent her a message. Actually, she reached out to me saying, hey, um, if you want, we can go to some open mics to have you try out stand-up. Right. And I was like, hell yeah, let's do it. Um, and so back in May, late May, wound up going to New York, went to two open mics. Uh, I wish I remembered the names of both of those places. Oh, no, Greenwichville Comedy. Uh, oh, I've done Greenwich Village Comedy Club. Yeah, that I was like, I that, like was that place. Yeah. That was a really good place. That was yeah. the second place I went to. The first one was more of a workshop, which I thought was really interesting. Because- you know why I had to do Greenwich Village Comedy Club? Because I felt like that's where... Jerry Seinfeld's character would have been yeah. practicing his kid. Because he lived in Greenwich Village on the sitcom, uh, you know? Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. No, it's definitely a fun place if, uh, for those who are listening. Definitely swing by there. Um, I know, like, for those who want to do open mics, uh, what are they called? Bring-ons? Is that what it's called? Bringers? Bringers, yeah. Wow, you are green to this, huh? Yeah. Bring- Bring on. Sorry. Yeah, bring I'm, on sounds more exciting. It sounds bring like, on. So it sounds like something from like Star Trek or I something. Know. Bring, bring on. Bring on. Bring on. <laughs> Ding on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, so since they're opening up again, like with a bigger capacity, they're doing more or they need bringers. So right. um, that's. So that's kind of why I've been holding off on going back over there. But again, if you if you got a posse, amazing, go there. Yeah. I would I want to go back there. Um, but going back to the workshop one, the very first one I did, um, what was cool about it is after I did my set, um, they pretty much gave me feedback on like what I need to do and. Obviously, for right. me, because it's the first time. So, to... is there some kind of competition? Like, oh no, 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 no! It was more like a workshop. It was like, oh, okay, okay, what are some things you did well? What are some things to improve on? Which was very helpful for me because I barely knew how to hold a mic. Right. <laughs> so I needed someone to be like, "Get you sold into the mic," and I'm like, "Okay, yeah." So, what was the feedback like, though? Does it was any of it like soul shattering? Uh, no, not really. It's just more. Uh, I think the host mentioned, like, just get comfortable on stage. Like, yeah. the jokes are there. Don't rehearse too much either. Yeah. Because uh, otherwise you kind of lose that engagement with the audience. Right. Um, and I think, and I pretty much took that feedback. I'm like, okay, that's very common sense. It was the very first time I did stand up. I wasn't sure where I would be. Um, I could have thrown up on stage for all I know, but fortunately I didn't. <laughs> I could have. You know, you never know. You never know. It could, it could have been part of the bit, though, if you throw up on Oh, stage. man, I wish <laughs> throw up on cue. <laughs> oh, man, that's more of an acting. That's one thing I haven't seen yet. I have seen many variations of nudity on stage. I've mm. never seen someone throw up on stage, though. Yeah, me neither. I wonder what that says about stand-up comedy, that... <laughs> We should have more of those, and yeah. maybe we should just have more randos. For some reason, open there's there's like a sect of open micers that like to wear women's clothing underneath their uh, what they're wearing, yeah. and then you know, reveal that they're wearing women's clothing. Fun is so I'm trying to figure out is that is the big message? Hey, I dress in women's clothing. I suppose so. Huh. I mean, you know, it's it's kind of crazy how like. Um, like, uh, I don't know, I, I feel like I should tread lightly here, because, like, um, I don't know, just like with with Pride Month and all the equal rights and then, you know, like, stuff mm-hmm. like that, where it's like, where it's like, drag queens have yes. always had, like, a special place in comedy. They're, right. They they got, like, a show over at Comics, like, mm-hmm. once every couple of months, you know, they, and it's like, they, they keep coming back, they keep yeah. getting booked, is what I'm trying to say. Man, have you seen a drag show though? I never actually have. Not oh, live. I should. mean, I've seen you know a couple of the RuPaul TV shows. Sure, but, sure. Yeah. I mean, that's that's still a clip, but yeah. And even them. then, it was like kind of against my will. You know, I I, I, I you know watch those drag shows, and I'm like, you know what they should have like as like a judge like on like the RuPaul's drag drag race. Mm. If they put like in like a comedians like like Jim Norton 
or um, like uh, Artie Lang. Like if those guys were judges on a drag show, mm-hmm. I th- I would think I would find it highly entertaining. Sure, sure. I mean, I can't really speak to the community because again, like I watch it because I'm like everyone looks fabulous. I'm all for it. Let's do it. Um, I think it is interesting because I do think there is a comedy component to it, but I feel like it really depends on who the drag queen is. Right. Um, because I mean, some of them are like, this is my life and I just want to perform. I dance. This is how I am. Uh, but again, I'm not too familiar with the community and how it's evolved too. Like I was actually talking to someone about, And again, I also have to tread lightly, too, because I think some of the things they said, I'm like, interesting. I never thought of it that way. So I guess, like, during the early awareness of drag, it was kind of seen as a way to mock women. Right. Again, it definitely has evolved since then. Yeah. But, um... I, it's Man, still, I it's, hope I don't get it. still is this. in a way, though, right? Isn't it kind of like a... It's almost like a uh, drag race isn't like... Isn't quite pro-trans as much as it is a parody of modeling. Right, so that's... You know what I mean? That's the thing about RuPaul that I've always been like on the fence on because of some of the statements that were made. And it's just... It's outdated mindsets. I think nowadays where our society has evolved, where, especially, like, non-binary, we're talking a lot more about it. It's like, if you want to wear a dress, go for it. It doesn't mean that you're a girl or a guy. It's like, you like dresses, you want to wear it. Yeah. Um, so I think with that mindset, you kind of take away the whole, they're trying to be a girl or they're trying to be a boy kind of thing. It's just, it's some sort of expression. All right. So. I think we should change the subject before I get too confused. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> say is that I'm all for it. I, I love what it's being evolved. Um, yeah. I think it's very fascinating. I mean, are the open mics we're going to are almost drag shows now with that comic Helga Man on the scene. She's cool. Uh, do you happen to know their pronouns by any chance? No. Okay. Hel- Helga Man's pronouns? Yeah. Well, she goes by Helga Man, but the full name is Helga um, X Man. Yeah. Ah, yes. I like her. <laughs> I like her. All right, so let's get let's get back to you. Okay. Um, and I, I'm especially interested in, in knowing this because we we grew up in the same town at the same time. Like, what what were you into as a kid when it came to comedy? I, mm, oh, you know what? Good question. Uh, I, I felt like so definitely in middle school, like it was all about like stand up comedians. I was always fascinated by it. Um. Oh, God, I feel like I'm a disappointment, <laughs> but some of the comedians were, like, Dane Cook. Yeah, but, but I, I at, at that at that age, I was really into Dane yeah. Cook as well. It's like, you, it's like who, you know, our age in our town wasn't listening to one of those Dane Cooks. Right. Series, uh, you know? I was also, at the time... You know what's interesting, though? Mm-hmm. I was working as an usher at the casino a couple years ago. Yeah. And the, Dane Cook came and headlined the, the casino. I was there. Did we talk about this yet? No, we didn't. But I, I went... <laughs> but all the other ushers, most of the ushers that work there are teenagers. Yeah. And none of them knew or gave a shit who Dane Cook was. Huh. And I just found that odd to me because I feel like everyone our age knows who Dane Cook is, yes. you know? So with my mini anecdote about Dane Cook, um, I, I was just talking to my parents about like comedy and all that stuff, and I was with my roommates, and they mentioned, oh, well, it looks like Dane Cook is going to be coming by to Mohegan Sun, or Foxwoods, I'm trying to remember which one. It was Mohegan. Yeah, that one. And they were like, oh, well, if we wind up getting tickets, would you guys go? And I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> they actually wound up getting tickets, so that's how I went to see Dane Cook. Right. Yeah. And, and what'd you think? When you saw him live. He was pretty good. I I definitely... It's not like his old stuff, which I think in a way is good. Um, But I I definitely got the... uh, I thought... Up in age type of... I thought his material was kind of weird. Like, there was a whole part where he's talking about... It's one of his first times on stage. And Mm -hmm. 
you know, he had like this whole bit where he like did an impression of a cricket and everything. Like that was kind of cool. Do you remember that? I vaguely, yeah, it's been a while. But then he also had this whole like his whole closing bit was about this stalker that was uh yeah. that was like following him on social media and the the stalker like this it was this woman that was stalking him and I just felt like the whole bit by the by the end of the bit I just or the end of the story rather because it was based on a true story yeah well, all I the the only feeling I was left with was why was Dane Cook enabling this stalker the whole time oh. why did he let her send him all those messages on Instagram why did why didn't he just block, block. her and like not give her that sense of false hope because that's what he was doing you know, I bet there's the little comedian in all of us that is like, this is really weird. These are uncomfortable situations, but let's see. It was almost this- like he was letting that woman stalk him oh, yeah. for the material. Exactly. You know what? When you bring that up. Which that- is so wrong. It is. <sighs> but uh, we all have done it. <sighs> like, I'm not too proud of it. Like, I'm trying to think of some of the... Oh, is that ice? <laughs> yeah. I guess it was just ice dropping. Breaking you, the you, ice You were just here. getting so heated there, some uh. ice just fell in the fridge. Right? <laughs> I'm just trying to think of what... Oh. There was... So I went on a date last Monday. All right. And I used that as... Is well. Monday like your date night? Apparently. Well, and I only asked that not because we're recording on a Monday, but you said you, uh, yeah, like yeah, yeah, you yeah. were going to go on a date and... What happened with that? Uh, they never reached out, and I'm like, all right, cool. That means I don't have to worry about... I hate dating, so... Sorry to hear that. No, I I just absolutely hate it. It's too awkward. People are all like... You're trying to present your best self in hopes to just get laid, and then when someone's like, I don't know, then it's like ghost, and I'm like, I don't understand the culture of dating. I like to just grab some coffee, get to know the person before we even establish a date. Like, get comfortable... Because I think we put so much emphasis on trying to be our best during a day. Um, but I guess it was also weird because, so yeah, when we met over on Thursday, um, I was talking to, I think he was one of the comedians. He didn't go up that night. Um, but I was just talking about how my life is a little complex when it comes to being like a, a mixed individual with both African and white Puritan genes. And yeah. how I was, I mean, East Lime is pretty. What kind of white? Uh, we're talking about Mayflower type of white. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. That type of white. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, like, not even like Italian or, um, you know, like, just, just like, just as white as you could get, you know? As Anglo, Anglo-Saxon we're talking here? Mm-hmm. I okay. think a portion of me is Scandinavian. Mm. So, and I, and of course, like, when you talk about Western European, like, a little... Uh, little bits here and there, but pretty much like English. <laughs> pretty much the main reason why our society the way it is. Mm-hmm. But anywho, so I was talking to him about it, and then somehow he had the smooth way of being like, "Hey, well, you know, like we should talk about this a little bit more. I'm interested in how your mindset is." And I'm like, "Yes, let's do it." And then I wound up taking out my phone, gave him my phone number type of stuff. And I'm like, great. So I walked into that. Okay. (laughs) Um, But the weird part was, so... This was a comic? I think so. I don't remember his... (laughs) Oh, no, I remember his name. (laughs) But... No, and that's... We're going to out him on... Are we going to out him on this or what? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. no, no. No, Okay. I think it was just a miscommunication. It sounds like you're... This is going to get weird. What is... (laughs) <laughs> it probably would uh I, so i'll just say this like from my understanding he is a comedian he didn't go up and do his stuff that night that uh, on thursday right um but we were talking afterwards right um seemed to like my stuff uh and then yeah uh, we were supposed to go on a date today at one o'clock, right. and then I I think shortly after he left, I was like, "Fuck, what did I just do? I don't like dating. I hate dating." Right. Um. So that's that story. And then last Monday. Oh, so you blew him off? No, because in all fairness, though, like I even have a message that says, "Hi, it's Whitney." 
and it was sent to him, but I never got anything back. Right. So we had no confirmation. Okay. I put it on my calendar just in case, but... Okay, not... so the ball was in his court? Yeah, and, um... and he, didn't, he didn't take his shot. I'm all about people taking their shot, which is why it's like, all right, I'll, I'll go on a date. I mean, there's food involved, fine. Right. But if you don't follow through, then what's the fucking point? Yeah. And so he didn't send me a message. I'm not going to reach out because I'm not going to be chasing after someone when I'm not interested in dating to begin yeah. with. You should, yeah, you're the female. You shouldn't be doing the, the chasing. Does, you don't want to do the chasing. <sighs> Yeah, I've already done enough chasing in my life. Chase, but. yeah, the chase. This uh, chasing is not good. No, I, yeah, because I feel like I'm just at a stage in my life where it's like I have other priorities that are lined up. Men are not one of them. Right. I wish they were, but they're not. Um, well, you're only a couple months into the stand-up game. You probably, I don't know, like if. It, Maybe you shouldn't be dating comedians. I don't. I don't know. That's well. Here's the thing. That's what I was thinking of. Like last Monday when I went on a date with this guy, and I'm like, oh, I should not be dating a comedian, a white comedian of all. And I was like, why am I doing this to myself? Right. Uh, it was a nice date. I'll I'll give him that. Uh, turned out he was 24. I was like, there's a little undertone where I felt like a cougar. I was like, Ugh. wow. Like, yeah, but maybe my standards are also too high. I was like, yeah, you're a little too young. <laughs> I think you're just a hot mess. I gotta be I am honest a hot with mess. you. <laughs> <laughs> All these opportunities coming back and forth. All and right, like, oh. so wait, let's let's go back in the, in, instead of talking about dating and all this Fine. nonsense. Let's get let's get back to the fact of the matter because I know the only the it, Dane Cook couldn't have been the, your only influence. No, growing no, no, up. No. Okay, well this one. This one had an impact, but again, not too thrilled with this one. Carlos Mencia. Wow. Which is not... I'm ashamed. I'm super ashamed. I knew I didn't like Carlos Mencia as soon as he hit it big, because it, yes. was, it was like right after the Chappelle show, mm -hmm. and then Carlos Mencia was like, oh, it's racial humor you want, and it was like, no, it right. was just like, the Chappelle show was just funny. Yes. That's... And it had racial humor, but then it's like Carlos Mencia had to take it to... The, and then come to find out he's this huge joke thief and all that, you know? The thing that made me turn... Oh, not turn... Turn off in, like, a very general way. I remember seeing... Like, there was this one heckler female who was talking about... Oh, sorry. Let me back up. He was talking about a joke about how women put on makeup to disguise their... Just to create a false disguise... And this woman who was heckling him was like, that's not what makeup's for. Like, it's it's more of an expression. And then he literally was just like, um, just, I don't know. He was just so downright disgusting with her. And I'm like, yep, nope, that's the day that Carlos Messia off my list. Really? Yeah. And then afterwards cause, cause... I heard about the <laughs> stealing the jokes and I'm like, Good riddance. See, I, as but as a comic, aren't you kind of like on the comic side, not the heckler? I don't like any kind of heckling. No, yeah. At the time, I think when I was a kid, I was like, all right, cool. That comedian was able to defend themselves. And, like, the audience laughed. A lot of them laughed. Right. But now I look back into my memory, I'm like, no, that heckler was right. Well, if you, if you want to learn what a complete narcissist Carlos Mencia is, listen to his interview with Mark Marin, where Mark Marin talks to him because he really outs him as a joke thief and Ooh. like really kind of like, you you kind of like get into Mencia's thought process of like how being a comedian should be. Yeah. And it's like, dude, nobody who's a comic actually fucking thinks like mm -hmm. that. You know what I mean? Didn't... Uh, it's so funny because I don't like this person, but he's made an impact in comedy. Joe Rogan, I heard outed. Um, oh, and Joe Rogan too. That's how his podcast became big. Was was uh, or him getting um, banned from the comedy store? Yes. After the whole thing with, that happened with Mencia is what started his podcast. Yeah. So, you know, <sighs> Joe Rogan. I just don't if, like his fans. If, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade, right? Yeah, you know what? Yeah. All the respect for Joe Rogan, he was able to make that and go big with it. I can't deny that. I'm just... 
<laughs> not a fan of Joe Rogan? Why not? What, is it, what turns you off about Joe Rogan? I remember, so for me, I was like, I wonder who Joe Rogan is. And I watched one of his interviews with Thomas Pappas, I believe is his name. Yeah. Um, and he was talking about... You like thing. him? Uh, I just heard that, I never knew this, that Rob Zombie directs his specials. What? Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. That's that is such an unusual combination. I never thought. That yeah, happened. I thought that too. I was like, "What the hell?" I don't know if that now. I don't know if it's true or not. But somebody we have to told, log into this. Yeah, we got to look into this. We need to invest our time and effort yeah. into this. Um, I think the times that I've seen him do stand up, I liked it. I don't think there was anything like outright like, "Oh, I I'm a huge fan of him," or "Oh, he's a disgusting human being." I think he held himself up very nicely during that. Um, that interview with Joe Rogan. And it was specifically the part where Joe Rogan was talking about, essentially, I call it a conspiracy theory about how uh, Dr. Fauci sent out an email saying masks don't work, all that stuff. And Joe Rogan was so fixated on like, America lied to us about the vaccine. And it's like, well, here's the issue. When you're talking about viruses, they're smaller than bacteria. So, Technically, in a way, it does go through the mask, but no one said that masks were impervious to it. It's just a behavioral reduction to make sure that people don't spread their shit to yeah. everybody else. Um, and so that's why I didn't like Joe. So you, so you base your opinion on somebody based on their their beliefs of the coronavirus. No, I, I will be fair. I've only saw five minutes of that, and I was like, I can't watch it anymore. Because honestly, like where I stand with the coronavirus is, is like. It's like they were making us wear the mask for a while. Then I got the vaccine, and then now we don't have to wear the mask. And it's yes. like, it's <laughs> like I don't want to say I'm a sheep, but I'm like, well, let's do what the fuck we got to do to get. Sure, to exactly. This. You know. Also, bear in mind, like, and then I have no strong feelings towards it whatsoever. Yeah, that's fair for me. My background is in public health. I actually got my master's in public health, so a lot of like the whole yeah. like the strategies that were going on with COVID. And just kind of analyzing how we can do better. Like, yeah. Like, for me, I have opinions on it. And I think my issue is that if Joe Rogan was going to go to that extreme saying that masks don't work and causing people to take off their mask, and, of course, we got the Delta variant that we have to worry about. Yeah. Like, that's also a public health threat. So that's how I interpret the interview. But, again, for right. the viewers who... Like, he's like this influencer that's trying to get is. people to not wear masks? That's... That's what I was worried about, the message that he was sending. I don't think he meant it, but, um, again, it was just very weird. It wasn't a good interview. Now it's like you got to I, – I feel like I kind of have to, like, backtrack some of the episodes I've, I've done of my podcast throughout sure. the pandemic, and I think my, my opinion on it has been constantly changing. I've been constantly flip-flopping sure. about how I actually feel about masks and all of that. Yeah, oh, it – I will say that it's such a confusing time because uh, I think, like, you'll see other countries, in, especially, like, in Asia where it's very community-based, like, the mindset is I want to make sure to protect other people so I will wear a mask. Right. Easy-ish. Uh, obviously, I'm sure it's a lot more complicated. But when you got a society like us where we're very individually driven, we're like, right. I don't want to wear this mask because I feel uncomfortable. I want to go to the gym, but I don't want to wear a mask because I can't breathe in it. So notice, like, the conversation and how you process it. Right. It's not a surprise that the U.S. has had a hard time with the whole mask policy. And I think not to say that the whole COVID... Well, you, you know what's crazy? Either. Like, the other, the other, yesterday was the 4th of July, yeah. and I went down to Jersey uh, to see the fireworks at uh, Six Flags with my brother-in-law and my sister and their kids. Nice. And there's a ton of people there. Yeah. And we're all watching the fireworks. Mm -hmm. And maybe like a handful of people are wearing masks, but mm -hmm. most people aren't wearing masks. And I just look around and I and I go, I say to my brother-in-law, I'm so glad the pandemic's over. And then I'm like, did that just sound like really ignorant? Because it's, I don't know, is it over? It's not over. It's... Because there's, it's like there's still illness out there. People are still dying. Still illness, still dying. I know based on what I'm observing, especially with the Delta variant, that has a bigger impact on those who haven't been vaccinated. Right. Um. So when the message is, all right, we can take our masks off. You're vaccinated? Yes. What, what kind did you get? I got the Pfizer. 
Pfizer. Yeah. I got the Moderna. Nice. Ooh. I heard Moderna had like a slight advantage for the Delta variant, but that's just rumor that I heard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Delta just sounds too sci-fi to me. I just learned about it in my sketch class. So, <laughs> so somebody just said Delta to me the other day, and I was like, Delta? Like, yeah. It's like a, it's it's another strand that yeah, we have to it's gonna, That virus is going to fly right into you like an airplane. Ear. <laughs> Oh, you think that's heard about the Southwest disease? <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> yeah, just named after airplanes and airplane companies. That's mm -hmm. perfect. But so, as far as a social behavioral level, I don't want to say we're all safe because there's always some sort of risk. But when it comes to our behaviors, it's like okay, it's nice to have a conversation. We don't have to worry about the six feet apart compared to last year. But again, just keep in mind how bacteria, how viruses work. Like, they're still around us. We just need to learn how to adapt. Yeah. Um, so that's why... What to, yeah. I, I think a part of the reason that I, I was never, like, like pro-mask, really, was... was the, is that, like... I just think, like, um, well, if this is really the rapture... We're not going to fucking be able to stop it. Right. <laughs> you no, know what I mean? Like, absolutely. And actually, I think one of my roommates was talking about, obviously, like, we were all wearing our masks as much as we can, especially out in public. But, yeah, that is a very common thing for people to think of. It's like, well, if this is the thing that's going to take me so Because I know a good amount of people that have died in the past Jeez. year yeah. or so. And it's like, it's fucking scary. But, and then at the same time, it's like, dude, is it like... You know, is is us, like, hindering ourselves from living our lives really going to fucking do anything? Right, yeah. You know? It's it's still a weird time. Because um, even for me, I don't think I can officially say COVID's over. Because it's still around us. It's yeah. just now we have some sort of barrier that helps protect us from it. But we never kill the virus. All right. So, so all we've talked about so far... It, um, in, uh, for your influences are Dane Cook and Carlos Mencia, <laughs> by the way. As I just wanted to bring it back to that real quick. Oh, man. How am I not diagnosed with ADHD is beyond me. No, it's not the fact that we went off on tangents. Is those are the two guys you picked are the ones that influenced you when I you were know. young. Well, I'll pick... So... <laughs> uh, I know. There's more. There is definitely more. Oh, you know, I like Craig Ferguson. When he I the, loved Craig. When he had the talk show, that was great. That was amazing. It was so underrated, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I think what's very... I feel like with his show now, if he continued doing this thing, I don't know if it would be as successful because of, like... He likes to flirt around with the guests. But right. the, the guests also play around with him as well. Right. Uh, but I feel like nowadays, if, if we see that, it's, like, canceled. But um, during his time on the show... I Amazing. Like, he's the type of comedian who I wish I have my set, but also can go off on a tangent, but still hit the points that you need to. Because right. there's something about him that is super improvised, and it just feels so natural when you hear him. And just, ah. Uh, now, what do you like better, improv or stand up? Wait, before I get into that, just, I first um, was introduced to Craig Ferguson yeah. through the Drew Carey show. Yeah. Like, I, when I started watching his talk show, I was like, Drew Carey's boss has a talk show? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> Of course, he's the boss. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I just wanted to... And, and, and hey, and, and what better way to lead into that question, because Drew Carey and Whose Line Is It Anyway, yes. all about the improv, but Drew Carey, also a great stand-up. Yes. So what do you prefer, improv or stand <gasps> Well, I feel like it's still not fair for me to compare because I've only done stand-up for two months. And you've I've done, done improv for... Pretty much two years. Okay. Including, like, the COVID stuff where we had to do Zoom improv, which is an experience. But you've done live improv shows and everything, and, mm -hmm. you know... Do you find it's, it's, it's easier to get the laugh doing improv than it is doing stand-up? So I will say that... Actually, uh, what was his name? I completely blanked out on his name, but that's okay. Uh, on Thursday, I was talking to someone about it. And it was a very good point because with improv, 
you have another person to bounce off your jokes. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to do things with more people yeah. than not. Um, and so with that, you wind up getting more laughs or you do something kooky on stage and people laugh. When you're doing stand-up, you're on your own. You, you can only rely so much on the audience to like, like accept your reality. Yeah. Um, because again, with your stage partner for improv, they kind of have to accept your reality. In well, order it's to funny that you bring up reality. Was it's like well, when you're when you're doing improv, mm -hmm. you are presenting a fantasy where it's like stand up is reality. Sure. Okay. So I use reality in a very interesting way because, like, with improv, when you're on stage and doing your improvised stuff, that's your reality. Right. If you're soaring in the air or swimming underwater that's your reality you go with it right. um even if you're even if you don't feel comfortable your partner has to kind of go with it right as i mime <laughs> i'm telling the listeners i'm miming swimming right all that good stuff with stand-up it's like here's my reality and people are like ha huh. or they give you silence so the audience has a lot more liberty to reject your reality right and it's a lot harsher with that in mind like, when I was considering doing stand-up, like, a while back, I was like, I want to try it, but I don't know if I would like it. It's not as bad as I thought. Like, I kind of accepted the fact that audience members won't laugh at every single joke that I have, because I'm also just new to it. Right. Um, but I kind of take those as mental notes. I'm like, okay, this joke works, this one doesn't, this joke works, this one doesn't. Um, and so it's kind of like a weird game for me mm -hmm. on like trying to figure out which jokes hit well and how can I make it better. And so with that mindset of persistently going through that, I think it's a lot easier than someone being like, I hope that the audience likes me. So. That, I mean, that I feel like that's the whole thing with improv is like that just like, it's, I feel like it's a little more desperate than stand up in a way. Uh, explain more. Because I, I think I might understand what you mean by that. I don't know. I just feel like it's like, um, I mean, uh, imp uh, with improv, it's like, I feel like it's just like, look at me, look at me, look how talented I am. I, 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 but at the same time, there's communities. So it's like, it's like the people that are the best at it are the ones that like give the, the punchline to the other person. It's like when I watch Saturday Night Live, I think... <laughs> Will Ferrell is like one of the best cast members of Saturday Night Live because not only is he really funny, but he like is the one always setting it up for somebody else to get the big laugh. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. So, it is interesting. I never thought of it as desperation before, but I see what you mean by it. I think, well, it may come off like that on stage. Or when you're an audience member watching. Yeah. But when you're on stage, you're literally panicking. You're like, uh, uh, I just want to get off. Please, someone tap me out. Tap me out. Um, that's usually what happens to me when I'm, like, doing a set. Uh, or I do something kooky and crazy just so we can move on to the next scene. Uh, but, but the other thing about improv is, is um, I, I don't know. As a stand-up, I feel like you do stand-up for long enough. It's like you can't go to improv. Right. Because it's like, so let's say like, you know, something like um, really kicks off with your stand-up mm -hmm. and then like your improv group or whatever, you know, gets jealous of you or whatever. It's just like, or wants to friggin' ride your coattails. I don't know. But it's like, th these are my fears of improv. But like, at the same time, <laughs> I've never gotten into it. I don't know. And I don't know anything about it. So it's, it's a different art. It's, it's. Weird because, like, improv and stand-up comedy is its own complete different jungle. Right. I don't think, like, if I were to do stand-up comedy, most times I'll come across improvisers like, oh, I cannot do that stuff. Kudos to you. Yeah. Um, so it's like, it's, uh, I don't want to be like, it's comparing oranges to apples to bananas. But it's like, it's a different muscle that you work for stand-up as opposed to improv. Right. Um, improv is more teamwork-based, where it's like you you as a team work together to create a scene for the audience, to get some good laughs, all that stuff. 
versus you where you have to do the setup, you have to do the punchlines, and you kind of have to accept your failures. On right. Your own. So I think stand-up is a lot scarier in that sense. You know what's weird, though? It's like, so, like, Saturday Night Live of today versus yes. of when I grew up in Saturday Night Live in the 90s. Yes. Is like when I watch Saturday Night Live today, is like I'm, I'm watching it and I'm thinking like these guys aren't comics; these are just improv nerds. Mm-hmm. While Saturday Night Live in the '90s was all those guys were stand-up comedians that were hired to be on the show. You know, right. like Adam Sandler, Chris Rock, David Spade, like all those guys yes. were stand-ups. Mm-hmm. So it's like I don't know. I, I feel like I, I just gravitate to more towards that world. And then it's oh, like absolutely. I also yearn for it. Like, I would much rather turn on a Saturday Night Live episode from the 90s rather than one of the new ones. I think part you know? of it is because back then, everyone had their own unique personality that comes in when they do a sketch. Like, um... Farley? Yeah, thank you. I, you knew exactly what I was thinking of. like. But he wasn't a... Stand- he's He's... One the the one guy from that era that was an improv guy, Wait, shit, and really? then and then he was then he had to friggin' I feel like he was trying to just top all the stand ups, oh, you know? Man, he was so good though. Yeah, he had me fooled. Uh, I I felt like you had some like Eddie Murphy, for instance. Like you can recognize an Eddie Murphy individual who is on stage, even if he's in a Gumby uh, suit or doing some other thing, like. Right. You're watching Eddie Murphy. As opposed to nowadays, it's like, you kind of recognize some of these people, but they're playing different characters. They all kind of, there's like a teamwork oriented. Yeah, the S- SNL sketches of today are a lot more collaborative. Yes. And the ones back then were like, they were all trying to do their own thing mm-hmm. and get their own, you know. Exactly. Get their own nut doing it, basically. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's funny because we talk about improv, we talk about stand-up, and then that sweet middle part is sketch writing. Yeah. That's what happens. I think sketch writing is like that um, that link that kind of keeps the improv world and the stand-up world. As, sometimes kind of I write sketches for me and other comics to yeah. do on this show. Yeah. I didn't write one for us to do, but That's okay. now, well, now, I'm, now I'm wishing... We ha- I had. I mean, you could always invite me back again. I got a shit ton of sketches. Actually, some of them I'm going to try to send over to SNL for... Everyone wants to send in their SNL packets. Yeah. I'm going to do it. I've tried sending some stuff to SNL and yeah. it got sent back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm expecting mine will get sent back, but uh, based on some of the classes I've been taking, especially for sketch writing, what's good about it is you may not get into SNL, which... I fully accept. I don't think I would be the right person for it. But other people uh, will be like, hey, you know what? This sketch kind of reminds me of the Astronomy Club. How about we send that sketch over to them and right. they reach out to you? So it's like a networking game. So uh, that's why I want to send in my packet because, yeah, I part of me is like, it, you know, what? I don't even know what would happen if I got accepted to SNL. Like, I... I don't think my mind would be able to process that. But most likely not. I will not be able to get right. into SNL. But you're prepared, though. Like, a lot of... You, you say you have, like, a packet. You already have, like, sketch, sketches and stuff like that written. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I, I've read, you know, and, and, you know, I've read and listened to a lot of podcasts. But, like, supposedly when Mike Myers was, was you know, hired to be on SNL, like, yeah. people were were jealous of like his work ethic because he he had already had all these sketches written and all this stuff to like put in the stack of sketches when he got there. Yeah. You know, while you know these other people get hired and then it's like they got to do the work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Part of it's because I've been taking classes where you have to turn in stuff, so it's like I've already created like a, a pile of like weird random sketches, different styles here and there. But the key thing, though, is being able to modify it and complement the best way for whoever you're turning the sketch to. Right. While also maintaining your style. Right. Um, that's pretty much my goal for my SNL packet when I send in. Like, the very first thing is, like, the, the big shock factor. What the... What, so, uh, you know what I like yeah. about you though? You're a dreamer. Like you're, you still, you still have that mindset. Like you know, like SNL, maybe you know, why not? But I'm a lot like, of comics don't have that. Where it's like, 
where it's like to this day and age where it's like it's like now everything is so accessible where it's like it's like oh I gotta go and create my own SNL and just put it out there and hope people like it. I you know like what that's I mean? It's own dream too, though. I, I think. I mean, I, I think that a lot of comedians do have dreams. I, well, not to say that you were saying that none of them have dreams. <laughs> I, I mean, I feel like, especially here in, in Connecticut, like, a lot of people are bitter, you know? Yeah. it's Connecticut's an interesting place for comedy. But, I mean, we also have, like, the geolocation advantage, depending on which part of um, Connecticut you're in. Like... I'm probably not in the best place, but if you're up north of Connecticut... But anywhere in Connecticut, you're still in the middle of everything. You could go yeah. to Boston and do that scene. You could go to New York and do that scene. No it's one's like, stopping you. Exactly. Yeah. I think some people are like, I don't want to drive that far. And it's like, well, then you don't want it very much then. And I know for me, that's kind of one of my obstacles is, bear in mind, I have a full-time job as a research assistant. So it's like, I, I still have to maintain my job here but I still have this dream where it's like, I, if I got paid enough to do comedy, I probably would quit my job. Mm. I hope my boss doesn't hear this. <laughs> nah. <laughs> um, I mean, if, it, if your boss has listened to this far, I mean, there's really nothing <laughs> they can do about it at this point. I, I think, well, part of it too is I have just got hooked on comedy because I think it's something that I want to do as a kid. I never thought... When I grow up, I'm going to be a comedian. It's more, I, I, I wish I can do all these things. But I also, as a kid, because I was super insecure, I never thought I was funny until I just uh -huh. went through life. And then I'm like, yeah, I can, I can be funny. I can make it work. Did you, like, did you like the show 30 Rock when it came out? I've seen some episodes. I, I didn't see anything wrong with it. I liked it. I think you um, should check that show. You're all about SNL and everything. Yeah. Why not? I so I like the old SNL. I don't like where SNL is now. Uh, but yeah, I think but it's, SNL, we're still talking like that's old SNL at this point. Yeah, you know. Okay, yep. You got a great point there. I completely forgot because that was like the Amy Poehler. Uh, why am I blanking out on her name? Tina, the, Tina, Tina Fey, Fey yeah. Tracy Morgan. Yeah, yeah. That was those were the big stars. Um, yeah, I definitely liked that part. And then everyone kind of just disappeared afterwards and i don't know where snl is now well let's let's talk uh voice acting you told me you're a voice actor let me hear some of these voices okay this will tie into some of my D, &D stuff so be prepared uh so for instance one of the characters that i recently created for a different campaign her name is Jukabi, and she's a rock gnome who is a bard barbarian so what that means is she's part bard she's part barbarian so there are times where she's like she wants to be very charismatic and cast uh, cast some spells and then there are other times where she gets really mad and she's like fucking rage that's pretty much it okay yeah it kind of reminds me of some cartoon i'm not sure sure which one uh, you know is that based on anything no it's just the voice that i can do <laughs> <laughs> it's just the voice I can do. So, so what else you got in there? I, I, uh, or am I putting you on the spot? No, no, that's fine. I, I like a good challenge. I'm just trying to think of some. I'm trying to think of some interesting ones because a lot of the workshops that I've done for voice acting is more like commercial stuff. So we don't do too much like cartoony stuff. Uh, so like commercials for Spotify and be like, like. I'm just gotta, I'm just trying to think of a script. <laughs> hey, I know you like listening to music. We do too. That's why we're gonna make you listen to 30 seconds of our commercial so you can get back to listening to your music. Stuff like that. Oh, like it's very right. like very silly. Um, and then the last workshop I did had more emotion to it. So like, uh, I wish I remembered the script for that one. But it's something like. It's gonna like sound weird. Screaming at people to eat Slim Jims. You know, what? let's do that. I want to. <laughs> Can we get into that reality right, right yeah. now? Okay, Timmy, why haven't you eaten that Slim Jim? I, I don't know. It's Timmy. What did I tell you about eating the Slim Jim? 
I don't know. What did, did you What did you tell me about eating the Slim Jims? I, I told you to eat as many Slim Jims as you can because they're about to expire in 24 hours. They are? Y yes! I told you so many times! Like, I don't understand why you never listened to me, Timmy. <sighs> this is taking an odd turn. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and scene. <laughs> Like that. Yeah. Um, I was thinking screaming at like how they say grab a do a slip gym in the commercial. Oh well. Uh, that's it might be an old commercial. Oh, know. is that the one with um uh, I suck at names by the way. If anyone has listened as far, I I'm really bad at names. One of the wrestlers. You know who I'm talking about. There's definitely Ooh, a... yeah. That sounded like the Kool-Aid guy. Hulk Hogan? No, no, oh, Miss Elizabeth. What? I oh, swear. um, ma Macho, Macho, Macho Man, Man. Yeah. Randy, Randy Savage. Randy Savage, yeah, he did a bunch of Slim Jim commercials. He did? I thought so. I guess so, that, uh, that makes sense, that yeah. would make sense. <laughs> God, there's so much I need to learn about life. <sighs> now, the thing about voice acting to me is like, like, um, what I, I, because I've worked as a voice actor before. Really? And what bothers me is that, like, most of the stuff that you hear on the radio mm -hmm. is fake. Yeah. It's like, it's like, even the people that you think are real talking are, like, paid voice actors to talk to the radio show host. So it's like, you suddenly realize that, like, fucking the radio is this false matrix while, like, you have to listen to, like, podcasts and shit like that to actually get, like, real mm -hmm. radio. What's free out there is this false fucking reality. Yeah. And that I, most people think is the real thing. Mm hmm So I think I understand what you're saying. So when, so like going back to the Spotify thing that I did, it's like you have a different tone and it's like I'm literally selling you to listen to more Spotify and all that good stuff. And way back, I mean, let's, we'll just say 1950s because that also, ha like when it comes to commercials, it's like all jazzy, like get yourself some popcorn here. And yeah. like, it's supposed to be in your face kind of thing. But now commercials uh, is so laid back where it's like, Hey, I know what you're thinking. I know you want Spotify. Sure you do. And it's like, there's something laid back about how you say it because people don't want the in your face anymore. They just want the, the chill laid back kind of vibe. Yeah. It's like, take it or don't. We're still here. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's what appeals to people. And then they wind up buying Spotify and all that stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just all has to do with, like, money being the root of all evil. Yes. I mean, you know, like, the best, I don't know, when it comes to voice acting, like, some of the best stuff you'll ever do is the stuff that you don't get paid for, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think of some of those. Ex well, I haven't been hired to do voice acting yet um although self-proclaimed voice acting well i'm gonna be part of well I'll, I'll help you get a gig i'll help you get some gigs voice acting. thank you that would be super helpful <laughs> <laughs> um oh speaking of which i i tried doing a bart simpson one but i don't think it sounds as good let me hear it uh hi i'm bart simpson who the hell are you it's too high uh, it's close. It's it's around that ballpark. I did a TikTok on it. Um, I don't think I went anywhere. It's, I think it's a little too cutesy to be Bart Simpson. <sighs> Hi, I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? A little uh, bit lower. I don't know. Yeah, it's getting somewhere. It's a, we'll get we'll get there. We'll get there. Who's the, Lisa's that her name? No, Lisa's the. Lisa's Yardley Smith, and it's like her real voice almost. I so know. It's like, like I think Lisa would be hard to do. I I guess I met the voice actress who does Bart's voice. Yeah. What's her Nancy name? Nancy Cartwright. Thank you. Yeah. Man, like I said, I suck at names. Everyone. What was that like meeting Nancy Cartwright? I never met her. Oh, no, I no, thought no, no. You, I thought you just said you met her. No, I just forgot her name. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I wish I met her. She's fantastic. Yeah. Um. Who was that random character in The Simpson who falls into the toilet? What? Isn't there a Simpson character who's like, I fell in the toilet again? Who's that? I 
don't know. No! I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if you're thinking of The Simpsons. I I hope the so. The character that falls into the toilet. Or he says that he falls into the toilet again. It's the one that's over at Moe's and he's like... Um. Oh, uh, Barney? I think that's his name. Barney. Uh, Barney? Uh, I fell in the toilet again. The one that burps? Yeah. 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 Doesn't he fall in the toilet? <laughs> I mean, I guess he may have fallen in the toilet or what <laughs> I'm not crazy. That's I'm all not, that matters. Okay, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not here to confirm or deny that Barney falls in the Fine. toilet. Fine. Well, so I want to say that Barney falls into the toilet. Well, we can check Disney Plus. We'll, we'll, we'll look it up. All right, cool. All right. Well, um, is there anything you want to plug or promote before uh, we wrap it up here? Uh, so a couple of things. Um, so the first thing is I have a Twitch show. It starts tomorrow, but I mean, whenever this gets out, it's whatever. Uh, so every other Tuesdays, first and third Tuesdays, I do a Twitch show called Chaotic Roll. All right. It is a D and D inspired uh, comedy. First show. and third Tuesday of the month. Yes. Isn't tomorrow the six. six? So technically, yeah. So my show would be tomorrow, but next Tuesday it won't be. But then the Tuesday after that, it will be on. Oh, okay. So I'm on like a bi-weekly schedule, which is why my schedule just with my life is so. Gotcha. Weird. So every other Tuesday, uh, D and D inspired comedy show. Uh, pretty much, I do a D and D session in about an hour. Right. And it's chaotic. And it's fun. I, I like to think it's fun. Um, and I believe the show starts at... It starts at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Bear in mind, it is an L.A. show, so for them it's 8 o'clock. So. Right. Um, but I believe for each episode, it should be up on YouTube. So if you can't stay up late like me, it will be up somewhere. Okay. What do they got to search on YouTube to get the show? Um, I believe I have to do Pack Theater for Twitch. So it's like, what is it? www.twitch.com slash Pack Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think for YouTube, Pack Theater, and it should be that page. So. Okay. Yeah. Great. Anything else? Uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah. That's what, yeah, that's it. Bleh. All <laughs> right. Well, Whitney Allen, thank you so much for being on the show. It was a real thank pleasure. You. Likewise, thank you.